Hello and welcome to this last of our um, study or study sessions, at least looking at the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And uh, here as we take a look, um, really um, the author is continuing on with that, that um, dialogue from the previous chapter where he's talking about how, you know, in, in the midst of youth, and he's talking about, um, and he's taking the step back. Remember chapter 3, there's a time and a season for everything and so on. Well, he's taking a step back and saying, with youth, there's a time and a season to enjoy the things of your heart. Um, but always keep, um, stay mindful of, of the judgment of God in the midst of all of it. And so really, it's a call to live with faith in mind. But then the other side is, is that he goes on and basically builds this in order to talk about how within youth that, you know, the same thing that we see moving throughout the entire book, enjoy the blessings that God has given to you, um, find pleasure in them when you have them, and then during the other times, you know, let them go. And then he goes on to this dialogue, you know, he's talking about how just in there's, there's a time and season for youth, there's also a time and a season for old age, and then the wrestlings and strugglings that go along with that. Then the end of the book basically wraps up starting at verse 9 there with really what amounts to and looks like uh, more of a conclusion that is added on after the fact of what the main content of the book is. And uh, again, still wonderful and wise words which, which basically take all of this teaching throughout the book and then solidify it and saying, you know, anchor yourself in that which is given from God in that gift of faith, that gift that comes through really this this pattern of sound teaching that comes to us through um, the written testimony of our Lord through um, through not only, well, in this case, the Old Testament scriptures, but as it's extended into the New Testament through what we have in the the established witness of, of the scriptures which tell us about God's love and God's grace. All right, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you today as we wrap up this study of the book of Ecclesiastes, and not not to claim that by, by learning the, the bits and few pieces of details that we've learned everything that there is to know about you or even about our faith, but that um, using this reflection, coming from this beautiful book of wisdom, that we would learn to be able to rest our lives in faith so that we would learn to live that faith day by day, trusting in you rather than resting on, well, our worries or our fears or our dreams about what might happen in the future. Bless us as we conclude this study so that our eyes would ever be turned to you and your blessings that come to us through Jesus Christ, which not only rescue us from this turning of the seasons, the way that, that Solomon wrote in this, this book in chapter 3, but also that you open up to us that new day of eternity in and through the, Jesus Christ our Savior, so that we, we have that hope even in the midst of the struggles and the vanity of this life. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord. Amen. All right. So building on the previous section where it talks about youth and um, basically is this reflection on youth and this call for us to take a look at our lives. Um, you know, be happy young men while you're young. It applies to women too. Don't worry about that. Um, but as, as, we're, as we're hearing this, be happy, enjoy the gifts that God has given to you while you've still got that vigor that's all there. And for us old oldsters and oldersters, um, so to speak, let's not be so judgmental when our youth are basically enjoying everything and we're sitting there starting to recognize, you know, the vanity of our own youth and then starting to notice all of the aches and pains within our bodies and these things moving along the way because... You know what? There's a time and a season for everything. But as the writer of this book, and I'll keep using the name Solomon because that's how Luther uses it, and I'm using Luther as a background for this as well. Um, as Solomon writes about this, he says, Enjoy youth, but at the same time do it with an eye towards understanding that God watches everything that we do. And that in the midst of our lives and in the midst of everything that's going on, there's this call to simply rest in that faith and that trust in God in the present moment so that you know, as we're chasing after in our youth, the things that give us joy and we're enjoying them and making use of them, let's not do that in a way which leads us away from away from um, our Lord's teaching of what is right and wrong, but that we anchor ourselves in that, giving thanks to God in the midst of it. Take a look at it in that bigger picture. 
And as we begin this chapter 12, as a result, as we listen to this, um, you know, Solomon continues on with those words. And, and I love this first verse because, well, for a variety of reasons, but mainly because this was also given to me as my confirmation verse many years ago. So he goes on and basically says, you know, with all of these things, banish anxiety from your heart, cast off the trouble of your body for youth and vigor are meaningless. You know, that too will come to an end. So we have a hint that this is the season's talk moving on. And then beginning with chapter 12, but in the midst of all of this, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. And here it ties it into the changing, turning seasons of our lives and that our life begins again in the way Solomon has talked about throughout the book with birth and then there's death. That, you know, there's a season and a time for everything. There's youth, and then there's old age. And here, as we look at this, tied to this sense of wisdom, wisdom is better than foolishness and folly. Hold on to that gift of wisdom. Well, <clears throat> here he draws it into closer understanding so that as he explains what that wisdom includes, it includes remember your creator. Remember God. First table of the law. No other commandments, don't misuse the name of the Lord your God, and honor the Sabbath day as, as we understand it um, in the context of the whole of Scripture, referring to um, finding that rest in Christ as Christ comes to us as we spend that time in worship in the Word. Okay, And, and we see that, you know, further unfolded as we, we look at the, the rest of this chapter. But as the writer of this book points out, Enjoy the things that God has given to you. Don't deny yourself of that. It's not a matter of austerity where we're sitting there looking at our lives saying that, you know, you, you dare not crack a smile and you dare not giggle or have a sense of humor as you look at life. Um, so quite often, and I think a lot of the problems that we face within our world today is that we don't have that sense of humor where we can take a step back and not only take a look at the changing circumstances of life, out there with a sense of levity, understanding that, you know, ultimately the good Lord um, is the one who allows things to unfold and then sets a limit and says this far, no further. Same thing applies to the way in which we apply things within our own lives. Because as we listen and as we look at that, how many times do we get so caught up with the worries and fears as though those are eternal and we are just so driven by those that we don't even know how to let go of them, and we think that this is, and then the racing of our hearts and our minds, this is how everything's going to unfold from this time forward, that we forget that that too has its season and its time where we have anxiety, and then it disappears. Sometimes we give a longer life to the anxiety that it needs to have by holding on to it. Or we have a bad day, crappy day. We assume that everything's going to turn out just bad and so we hold on to that feeling and we just nurse that feeling even though we don't want it but at the same time we're clinging on to it in a way that gives it an extended life beyond what it needs to have rather than simply saying you know what Lord I'm having a bad day right now but at the same time I trust that you're the one who's going you know who's unfolding things as they need to. Well here in the same way as we take a look at these words and these wise words, to train ourselves, to train our children, even in their youth, to have that view to look up towards God, to make use of the scriptures, the promises of God, to make use of their baptism, that promise of forgiveness, that all of these things, especially the troubles that we face in the world and the craziness of the world as we look at it, those things as much as they have this sense of power and we worry about them and then it creates that extra anxiety, um, they too will have their end. And instead, the gift of God that comes to us through Jesus Christ, who teaches us in his eternal word, that is what will last forever. So remember your creator um, and, and to be able to communicate that to the younger generations today becomes part of the challenge because in so many ways with social media, with the news, with um, 
you know, the way in which education unfolds and all of the different new ideas and philosophies that are running around, which are basically building on various forms of anxiety and various forms of restlessness within the human heart in order to try and, you know, use that restlessness in order to create peace. Um, that, that doesn't work. Um, but, in, but basically, the youth nowadays are inundated with that. We're inundated with that, even as older people within the life of the congregation. And as we look at that and consider that, um, the more and more that we can call people back to that stillness and calmness as we remember our Creator, the Father, who sent His Son, Jesus, to be our Redeemer, who likewise gives us His Holy Spirit in order to be that sanctifier, that renewer, that we always and continuously be wrapped back and brought back to that simple realization that, you know, um, we do what we have in front of us to do, and we do it with joy, with an eye and a view towards our Lord. But at the same time, you know, trust Him. And do that now for, you know, those days of our, our senior years and the waning years of our lives creep in. And we get to the point where, well, we turn into grumpy old oldsters along the way. Um, I, I love that line. Before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. We all have these prototypical images of these grumpy old people that, that just grumble about stuff because nothing is right and their knees, knees ache and their joints hurt. And then every morning you wake up and there's something brand new in, along the way. And the reality is, is that's what happens. And this is where Solomon digs in and he points out, you know, as we get older, He's talking, too, about a world where there really is no medications in the modern sense where we can alleviate a whole ton of those sorts of things. And so he is really depicting the ending and the waning years of human life in this very realistic sense. Um, and, and the challenge for us as we read it is that we don't just turn this into the straw man type of a figure saying, oh, that's just people over there, or take it and internalize it saying, that gives me every right to be grumpy and all these sorts of things along the way. But Solomon's whole point is, is that in the midst of life, both in youth as well as as we age, that we take a look at this and we do it from the perspective of faith, recognizing that the craziness of youth as well as the slowing down phase of old life, older age, basically all of that is something which our Lord has taken into himself in Jesus Christ. And as we pay attention to this, we recognize that all of this meaninglessness of life under the sun, you know, the meaninglessness of, you know, youth as we look back on it and the frivolity of everything that we got into. And then as we take a look back and we say, I wish I would have done it differently, you know, that meaninglessness, to let it go, let go of that anxiety and rest in God's grace in the present, in that gift of faith, in that remembrance of our creator, our redeemer, our sanctifier. And the same thing as we age, so that as we learn to age in grace, um, that's as much a part of wisdom rather than simply becoming the person that simply grumbles. I wish I had it like it was back then, but then that was all foolishness, and now look at me, and then I can't do all of these sorts of things. And why doesn't everybody do things the way that we used to, but we can't do it that way anymore, and all those sorts of things. And we know we get into those ways of grumbling and racing around in our minds. The point is not to reach for the past or to worry about the future, but to be in the present with faith, trusting in the Lord morning and evening, which again is why Luther suggests begin and end each day making the sign of the cross, remembering your baptism, remembering where God has called you and placed you, no matter how young or how old, you know, how, how vigorous and youthful or, or how, with how many aching bones, um, that no matter who we are, we have been baptized into Christ, into his death and resurrection, so that even now, our Lord holds us in both with that promise and that gift of eternal life. All right. So um, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the, uh, before, you know, the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Verse 2 continues along with that. But for the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark. 
or dim, and the clouds return after the rain. Basically here, um, using very naturalistic imagery, which Luther then builds on, basically says, even within our own bodies, you know, he uses this, this um, medieval sense, which we forget in our world today, that God has created the world through his word. It's a reflection of his word. But then we also are created in the image of God. So that humanity is a reflection um, in small form, a microcosm, so to speak, of the macrocosm, the cosmos around us. And we see that reflected not only in the struggles and the vanity in creation, broken creation, in you know the political realm, broken, sinful political realm, but also within our own lives, broken, sinful, broken life that we have. So before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow, grow dark, you know, our eyesight starts failing on us. Luther goes on and he says, and then also in the clouds return after the rain. And he says, usually within the cycle of nature, you know, you have this big thunderstorm. And then afterwards, there's this tranquility, this, this rejuvenation, this calm and this peace. And then as he applies it to human life, he says, during, you know, youth, we go through those times of great angst, and then there's all of a sudden this great calm and joy and celebration afterwards. But as life draws to its end, sometimes those dark clouds, they don't necessarily lift in the same way as they used to. And so as we look at all of this, there is that time of trouble that he talks about in verse 1, where we seem to dig ourselves or to be digging deeper and deeper into um, trials rather than rather than having that bouncing back and that resilience of youth but even that resilience the way that Solomon says basically that resilience too at the end of chapter 11 even that is a meaning meaningless and he goes back to that here verse 3 when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop and when the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim and so here um, not only do you have the sense of a household, okay, just in the same way in which, you know, the keeper of the household, as he ages, he trembles a little bit more, we get shaky as we age, and then we don't, we don't stand upright anymore, we start to stoop, stoop and so on. Um, Luther applies this also to our lives within our own bodies as that whole house and that microcosm, and so the keepers of the house tremble, our minds don't become as certain as they used to be. Remember the certainty of our youth and teenage years when we knew everything, supposedly. And then we go through and we discover we didn't know anything in our 20s. And then all of a sudden we go back to a certain sense of certainty. But then as we age, we look back and we say, what was I thinking? And all those kinds of things. Well, that that uncertainty starts to sink in as, as well, our, our lives wane. And we start to look at ourselves and say, you know, all the things that I used to build my identity on, my certainty on, um, we see those sort of slip away as we age. Um, and, you know, God doesn't want to leave us without hope. That comes to us in Christ as a gift that isn't based on you or me or how well our body hangs together, but on what Christ has done. And it leads us out of the way that Paul writes, this valley or this veil of tears, um, where, um, where, where basically the brokenness of everything under the sun, the foolishness, the vanity of it, the meaninglessness of it, the way that Solomon writes, um, that will come to an end. And we've already been planted, God has already planted eternity in our hearts through the word, through Christ. Okay, but then, <clears throat> so he says, the keepers of the house, he says the head, and the strong men stoop. Stoop. And so instead of shoulders being up and strong, it says, you know, the shoulders start to stoop. They hang a bit lower. And the grinders cease because they are few. Um, Luther, and I found it rather funny, he, he basically draws an analogy there to the teeth. You know, nowadays we have dentures. Back then, not necessarily so. And so all of a sudden, the grinders, the teeth that we lose over the years of, as, we, as, as our, our teeth decay and these sorts of things, well, the grinders don't work the way that they used to. And so eating food all of a sudden becomes that much more difficult. And those looking through the windows grow dim. Um, and basically, he replies that to the eyes. Well, our eyes don't see as well. So as much as we'd love to go, you know, watching life go by out the windows of our house while well, the windows of our soul they grow dim so we can't observe things around us all of these things cut us off from that that sense of connection with the world so that as we wrestle with that and this does happen as we age as we wrestle with that 
we, we become restless on the inside because there's that sense that we're cut off from everything. And we, don't, we aren't able to find that same source of joy, um, enjoyment and pleasure, even in just watching the birds in the trees, those sorts of things. All right, verse four, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when men rise up to the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. I, again, and Luther basically draws this into this sense of aging where um, as we age, not only are we not able to go out as easily as we used to do, so the doors to the streets are closed and the sound of grinding fades. Um, he also ties it into the way in which we're not able to express ourselves necessarily in the same way and we find ourselves tripping over our words men as men rise up to the sounds of birds but their and but all their songs grow faint um luther ties that into how um as we get older i'm already going through that sleep becomes more difficult so you end up um the smallest sound wakes you up but at the same time you know you can't even hear things properly whereas youth he says they can sleep through thunderstorms and they seem to be just fine all of these things start to grow or, or, or to fall into place. All to highlight the beginning and the opening of this chapter. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before, you know, all of these troubles of old age start to come in. Verse five, when men are afraid of heights and dangers in the streets and when the almond tree blossoms, Luther applies that to the graying of the hair. Okay, almond trees flowers blossom before the leaves come out and so basically when your hair goes gray and then the grasshopper drags himself along and desire no longer is stirred um grasshopper um luther basically says as we age we turn into skin and bones and so we look more like the grasshopper um and then desire no longer is stirred and luther says that it's not necessarily talking specifically about sexual desire but at the same time all other desires is all of our other desires we just don't have the energy to to chase after them um these are part of the troubles as we age and um for youth it's important that they learn that these are natural changes within within our lives and for us as we get older, um, it's important to be able to hold on to that gift of faith and the hope that comes through that faith, um, even in the midst of those changes. One of the struggles that we have is, is that we, we usually, um, and this is part of all the stuff in commercials, how many products are out there to make sure that you keep looking young, young and feel invigorated and all these sorts of things. You know, all of these commercials which which um, valorize a certain age group. And, and then as we, you know, as we age, we're sitting there watching all of these things in the sense that real life happens at that particular age group. Um, it's very easy for us to fall into that way of thinking. And um, we, we lose touch with the real sense that life does have its cycle. Um, as we hear that, and as Solomon reminds us of that, um, in that sense of holding on to that, um, that, that, that sense of faith, that sense of wisdom, that remembrance being drawn back to the present moment here becomes um, such an important part for us, not only in our youth, but also in our old age, in our aging. So that rather than simply hankering after what society says is the good life, we realize that the good life um, comes to us from God in Christ as a blessing, as a gift, which we get to have a foretaste of here on this side of eternity, but which Christ has opened to, uh, up to us so that in him, with him and through him, we have that, that, that entrance into heaven where all of the meaninglessness and the struggle, you know, the, the trouble of old age, the vanity of youth, all of those sorts of things will fall away. Okay, then man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Um, as Solomon writes that, basically, he says, you know, it's good to begin in youth to have that strong sense of faith where we're drawn back to that realization that everything around us um, eventually grinds to a halt. So that as we you know, remember, that's that memento mori, that remembrance of death. Um, 
as we remember that from youth onwards, we learn to keep our lives in perspective. In the same way for us as we age, it's to keep that into perspective, you know, the remembrance of death. Not in order to, to you know, be nihilistic, you know, in the sense that everything's going to just get destroyed in the same way that we get with some of the panics relating to um, climate change. Climate change is very real, but the panic becomes unhelpful because it just increases anxiety within the world. Um, there's lots that we don't know about climate change. There's lots that we do know about climate change, you know, using that as an example. Same thing with life. There's lots that we don't know about life, even at our, you know, even as we're aging. There's lots we don't know about life yet. Um, and there's lots that we do know about life based on how we grow, how we mature, how we make our mistakes, how, how we face all of these situations in life. But to remember not only our mortality, it's there to have us remember, you know, and to put our trust and our faith in God in the midst of every step along the way. So that both in good times and in bad, in youth as well as in old age, that our attention is turned to the one who is our creator, and the one who sent his son to redeem us, Jesus, and the one who gives us Holy Spirit in order to renew us, to keep us tied to that true faith so that we are connected to heaven. So that here, as we listen to these verses, we will die this side of eternity, unless we're among those that are still here on the day in which our Lord returns, in which case we will be caught up in the air together with all those who have died in Christ, so that you know, building on that baptismal reality, they're in Christ, and we through baptism are in Christ, so that when Jesus returns, we will all be there together with him. Um, you know, with this this visual, vis physical appearance of Christ, um, the fullness of the church will be there together with him. And so here Solomon wraps up this section by saying, remember him, okay, going back to remember your creator. So it's not only in your youth, but even now, before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken, okay, um, I'm not entirely sure what all the associations culturally are there, but um, basically a reference to, to death itself, the golden bowl, the beautiful golden bowl of life, it's shattered. Before the pitcher is shattered at the spring, or the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, drawing us back beginning of our Lenten season, dust you are into dust you will return. <coughs> of course, from our funeral celebrations as well, as we say that over not only the ashes of the body as the body is laid to rest, draws us right back to the source of our creation, our creator who created Adam and Eve from the dust of the ground. Okay, we return to the dust <coughs> and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And there, right into the, again, the creation account, where God forms our bodies from the dust of the ground and then breathed, the word underneath is the same as the word for spirit, breathed the breath of life into him. So again, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, everything is meaningless. It's a reminder, this side of eternity, that's all we got. Except for what God gives, and to rejoice in that, Give thanks to God in that, to bear up under the struggles in the moment with faith in God, and to keep our eyes focused on, well, as we just celebrated Lent and Easter again, keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, because in him we have that gift of eternal life. All right, jumping to the last few verses. Um, this, this, this is tagged on like a conclusion to the whole book. So not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. So again, basically pointing out Solomon, or the author basically, had great wisdom and he was able to use that in order to teach. Um, he pondered and searched out and set order many proverbs. And so basically, a lot of these proverbs and sayings were not necessarily his own that he came up with. But as he heard them and as he gathered them together and these wise sayings that were scattered around, basically he spent time, you know, thinking, using them to, to meditate on, on life and meditate on, on faith in the midst of that and wisdom in the midst of that. 
And so he basically gathered those together and put them into order here within this book. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. And so again, just a summary saying that, you know, what's here is trustworthy. The words of the wise are like goads and collected sayings, like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Uh, and, and, and so building on the sense that these are good and reliable words. And so these are good things to be able to hold on to in order to guide and direct us within life, just like a shepherd directs life. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Here, Luther basically points out, this is an Old Testament example of, you know, this call to sola scriptura. Scripture alone, there's all kinds of writings that are out there. But rather than going chasing after all kinds of different ideas, stick with what is sure. Stick with what is certain. And it's not to say that science or all these other things aren't worth pursuing and looking into, but in the same way that everything has its season, well, all scientific theories, all social science theories, all kinds of other things within society and culture, they have their seasons and then they pass away too. Don't assume that science just means that this is the answer right now and therefore it's the answer that it's absolutely true forever because, you know what, in 10, 15 years, all those things will be challenged and re redesigned into new theories and all these kinds of things. Well, when it comes to life and faith, here, Basically, the way Solomon writes and the way this book is pieced together, it's this warning to, instead of chasing after all kinds of strange ideas, stick with what is true, what is tried, what is tested, what is inspired, as we hold on to that, and as the rest of Scripture unfolds in the way that Luther pointed this out, basically <coughs> hold on to the good gift, what God has provided through the Word, which points us not only to the vanity of life, but then also to the way in which God has broken into it in order to save us. <clears throat> and so he goes on, of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. And so even though there's lots of different writings, not all of them are equal. And, you know, chasing after that, that too becomes this toiling and chasing after the wind. Hold on to what is true, what is good, what anchors us in that faith and that hope and that wisdom, that remembrance of our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sanctifier. And then verse 13, now all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. So, good summary of the book, fear God, sense of honor God, remember the Lord, remember in humility, dust you are and to dust you return. He is our Creator, so fear God and keep His commandments, so His teaching, His words. For this is the whole duty of man. And so it's the whole, the, really, what, you know, the, as much as we get busied with all these other things in life, that really is the business that we need to be about. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Um, and, and as we hear those things, it's that humbling realization that God sees our sin, he judges sin, but as we see it fulfilled in Christ in the New Testament, he takes that sin onto himself in order to cover over those sins with his righteousness, baptism, his blood shed for us. So that in Christ, okay, and here's the fun part, this hiddenness message, every hidden thing, that's why we confess our sins, okay. Um, not in order to tell everybody and start going around, I did this, I did that wrong, and all those sorts of things. Um, but we confess our sins in order to unhide them before God. Not that God doesn't see them, but that we become um, conscientiously honest about our brokenness as the Holy Spirit leads us along that path so that these things are no longer hidden, not from our eyes and not from God's eyes. But then the other side is, is that in baptism, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Okay, that's Paul, Colossians. So that when Christ returns, as I mentioned before, all those who are in Christ, you know, those who have died in Christ, those who are still here when our Lord returns, we will all be there together with him. Um, the fullness of the church, those who are wise, resting in that gift of faith, that will be revealed as well.
beautiful ending. All right, as we close off, the Lord be with you, and we will talk to you soon. We'll see you again in our next study. Bye for now.